Hi everyone, my name's Sam Illingworth. I'm a senior lecturer in science communication here at the University of Western Australia and it gives me great pleasure to welcome you to another webinar in the Science Exchange series at the University of Western Australia. I'd like to introduce our speaker. Dr Nick Callow is senior lecturer in the UWA School of Agriculture and Environment. He completed a BSc Honours and PhD in Geography at the University of Western Australia and a Graduate Certificate in Higher Education from the University of Queensland in 2011. He's also worked for the Department of Agriculture and Food Western Australia and UWA State Centre of Excellence in Ecohydrology and at the University of Queensland. He's a geographer who works across the areas of hydrology, geomorphology, geographical information science or GIS and remote sensing and his work is focused on advancing our understanding of Australian landscape processes with a focus on human interaction with landscapes and the impact of changes in climate. His research group holds the Remote Operator Certificate from Civil Aviation Safety Authority to manage drone operations for UWA where he is the Chief Remote Pilot and Maintenance Controller. So Nick, please take it away with your talk today. Yeah, thanks a lot, uh, Sam, and, and uh, welcome to uh, to everybody. Really excited to uh, to be able to participate in the in the series. So, yeah, I've got a, a, a big interest in in drones, but also you know various uh, remote sensing um, techniques and and uh, and using emerging technologies in in geography. So, what I wanted to uh, to start with is is talking a little bit about the drone industry, and I think people uh, might kind of um, Think of it as being maybe relatively uh, mature but in fact it's really uh, quite young and I really quite like this quote here from the uh, Economist magazine which basically sort of says trying to predict what's happening in the drone industry at the moment is something like forecasting what happened in computing in the 1960s or the mobile phone technology uh, in the 1980s so it's a really interesting and fast moving sort of area and certainly one uh, which is difficult to keep up with the industry itself has largely come from um, the military use of drones and the actual name drone is more um, from that military area but it's sort of become part of uh, the popular usage. Um, the sort of main areas that I guess we sort of more operate in is that, uh, is that commercial and civil application. That's actually the sort of fastest growing uh, part of the sector. Uh, and then this sort of com consumer use, which is more around the, uh, the use of drones for photographic uh, sort of areas. And that area sort of grew um, the fastest. What I wanted to do was to sort of place this in a bit of a visual context. So uh, this slide here, we've got on the top, this sort of evolution from the first mobile phones being introduced into uh, America uh, in about 1983. And then to sort of look at the sort of growth of the consumer use uh, and that more sort of civil uh, use of drones, the non-military use. So, you know, effectively we're only 10 years into this. So if you think about it in mobile phone terms, we haven't even got to the Motorola flip phone. Flip phone. We haven't even got to a, a Nokia 3210, which was the first uh, phone that I ever owned. Um, and we're certainly a long way away potentially. So, you know, the, the iPhone, the, the modern sort of generation of smartphones, which really, you know, changed the nature of how mobile phone technology is used, you know, that didn't happen until about 24 years uh, down the track. So, you know, to give you a sort of an idea of this area down the bottom there, the UWA Octocopter was the first main drone that we were using for research purposes. You know, it cost us close to $15,000 to put together all of the different equipment and it flew for six minutes, which was pretty uh, rock and roll and, you know, restricted what we could do with it. Now that very same uh, functionality in a drone only, you know, four years later, I can go into a consumer electronics store and buy one for about $2,000. So this whole area is changing dramatically. We've also got uh, changes in terms of uh, other sorts of uh, robotics technology becoming more popular, things like these Boston Dynamics uh, robotic dogs, if, if people have seen them, but, you know, ways of mounting uh, sensors and, and using robots in, in the sort of um, becoming more popular and common. And, and the use of drones uh, is interesting to look at in terms of what's called uh, gardener's hype cycle. So in this one here, you can see this sort of period of rapid growth and interest uh, followed by this what's called trough of disappointment. So you can um, see, I'm not sure if you can see the detail in this slide, but 
Now, drones are very much in the bottom of this trough of, of disillusionment uh, at the moment. So there's a lot of questions about, you know, how we're actually using the technology and, and really that's some sort of issues I want to uh, focus on today. For people out there who might be interested and, and, you know, maybe some younger people who are thinking about, you know, what opportunities are out there in the drone industry for them, it's quite an interesting one to look at the, um, the civil uh, and commercial opportunities. And that's, uh, you know, the largest sector, it's growing rapidly. Uh, and there are significant emerging opportunities in this area. I really tried to break it down into about four key areas that I see uh, for people. And that's for the sort of R&D um, work around the sort of hardware and software, robotics, and what I'd call sort of system integration specialists work in the sort of IT, big data, data processing, alg algorithm development, uh, IT solutions for cloud processing, um, and, and those sorts of areas. Areas in the more traditional remote sensing, so the GIS and spatial data, remote sensing, uh, the operations and logistics and collection of the actual data. Uh, and then the last one would be in what I'd call industrial translation. So that's really taking these data products and then, you know, being able to turn them into things or interpret them for different um, uh, sort of groups. And, and uh, you know, agriculture is, is a good example. And I'll give uh, some examples there. So at UWA, we've actually got a huge uh, sort of array of different degrees and offerings. Again, for younger people thinking, you know, what sort of degrees could I do, you know, that would allow me opportunities. And there's some tremendous work and people that are operating in this space. So uh, that sort of uh, hardware, software systems, you know, in the, some of the Bachelor of Science offerings in computer science, engineering science, data sciences, through into the master's programs. Uh, nice photo there of, of Thomas Brunel in that uh, sort of area who does some tremendous work and actual real hands-on uh, work with, uh, with robotics and some of the students out of those programs are ones that, uh, you know, I'll come across in industry. Uh, people working in industry who are also lecturing into some of these UWA programs, uh, doing some really amazing stuff. Um, opportunities in this sort of uh, GIS remote sensing space through things like the Bachelor of Science in Geographical Sciences and Environmental Sciences. Shirin Hickey, uh, lecturer in, in that sort of area, uh, does some really cool stuff looking at mangroves and mangrove carbon accounting and remote sensing uh, techniques. Uh, through into the Masters of Environmental Science and the specific um, specialisation there in sensing and spatial data sciences. Uh, which is, you know, really directly aligned to some of the areas of, of, of drone utilisation. Um, and then the last one into industrial translation, and it was sort of really nice to see uh, the new program that's uh, been put up by my own school, which is um, into that agriculture technology specialisation. Um, so from 2021 within the, the Bachelor of Science and the Masters in Agricultural Science, there's uh, uh, program there and Kent, nice picture of Kent, Ken Flower, who's who's driving a lot of the work in that area. To um, understand drones and what you can actually do and use, and and how you know people at UWA use these, or or people who are at UWA who are asking this question about how they can use them, the um, usage of drones really broken up into different weight groups by the uh, Civil Aviation Safety Authority. Most of the work that we would do would fall into this category of using very small drones, so the less than two kilo class. Uh, and drones in that category, staff and students, um, we certainly have both that are, are doing this, can operate with what CASA calls their excluded class. So if you fl fly in standard operating conditions and a sub two kilo drone, you can uh, register with CASA and uh, through the normal field work processes at UWA, we have people who are uh, operating through that process. The other one is through the uh, Remote Operators Certificate or the REOC and the uh, Remote Pilots Licence. So we have uh, people that are licensed to use uh, aeroplanes and um, uh, multi-rotor aircraft up to the 25 kilos. There's also the opportunity if we wish to, and uh, sadly the uh, faculty's infrastructure budget doesn't quite extend to purchasing Global Hawks at the moment, um, but uh, CASA allows for the uh, capability to operate what they call medium, so they're up to 150 kilo, and you can actually fly these on 
on uh, on land that's uh, owned by you or by the university um, and then the large uh, aircraft and not really operating within Australia but certainly within the United States there are research organizations operating large uh, drones the uh, standard operating um, conditions are uh, really you know a set of, of rules that are, are there to really protect safety and protect people the the ones that I've lined up here on the top, I'd kind of categorise as the broadly non-negotiable ones. So they're the ones that everyone needs to uh, be aware of. So obviously avoiding conflict with any other people or property, uh, emergency situations respecting privacy. The ones on the bottom are ones that um, under the standard operating conditions you can't really do. So in any sort of populous areas and beaches are, are um, explicitly uh, listed as those within 30 metres of people maintaining what's called visual line of sight so that the aircraft is sufficiently close to you uh, and these other uh, categories. Within the um, remote operator certificate we have a series of different permissions um, and approvals. So for example we can um, you know, have training to mitigate risks to operate in some of these areas. We have uh, approvals to operate within 15 metres of people. Uh, we've got uh, CASA instruments that allow us to um, uh, operate at night, uh, we can apply through CASA to um, get around some of these other rules. So there's this opportunity for staff if you're needing to, uh, and for people who are using them more broadly, to um, you know increase the um, range of activities that they can do by moving in from that excluded class operations to the ones where you actually have the remote pilot's license. So just wanted to sort of had a nice run through of, of, of uh, profiling some of the amazing work that uh, people are doing. Some of it's my group, but some of it's certainly a range of other groups uh, across, the, across the university. So, you know, there's huge diversity. You've got really nice slide here from uh, Jeff Hansen and uh, word on the street is he might be giving a, a talk down the, uh, down the track. So, um, you know, I won't uh, steal too much of Jeff's thunder, but they do some really fantastic work uh, looking at changing in beach profile and beach dynamics. Nice one of them uh, taking off their little uh, fixed wing EB there down on the beach, which they've got all the appropriate permissions and approvals uh, to do. Uh, some slides here on the left from a PhD student, Naima, who's looking at uh, shark aggregation studies. Uh, again, you know, with the appropriate uh, animal ethics approvals and, uh, and her field sites, which happen to be in a military restricted flying zone, which also requires some work. But uh, yes, yeah, super, um, you know, interesting uh, usage of data and the sort of collection of data that, um, you know, wouldn't otherwise be possible. Some really interesting work that I've sort of been lucky to have been involved with, but also some other groups at the university who are very active. The Centre for Rock Art Research and Management in the uh, archaeology group does some tremendous work as well with um, imaging archaeological sites. Some really cool um, sort of things to, uh, to, to be able to work on some of the amazing rock art in, in the Burrup Peninsula, um, what uh, appear to be foundations of, of human structures, um, you know, built uh, you know, tens of thousands of years ago, um, and also some work that we're involved with through the Kimberley, trying to reconstruct the paleo climate by using drones to image uh, lakes and uh, reconstruct the regional climate. So the the the, the uh, project there is trying to reconstruct sixty thousand years of of climate, and and using drones as one of the many techniques to uh, to try and do that. Here's another sort of example of some of the work and uh, this time it's using thermal imaging. So it's flying a thermal camera on a drone and processing the data to look at the temperature. And in this case, we're linking uh, monitoring of trees in the Kings Park area. And the point cloud that you can see on the right hand side uh, is showing temperature. So the red is hot. Uh, and that's areas of the ground of bare, um, bare soil, which is, you know, 50, 60 degrees on a warm day in summer. Um, and then the tree canopy is between 20 and 25 degrees. So what you're actually seeing there is the effect of the trees um, pulling up the water and being able to transpire. The image on the left, we're looking at, again, hundreds of oh, thousands, tens of thousands of points of thermal points uh, within the Kings Park area. 
um, and different sorts of trees and these amazing relationships that you've got between different types of trees. So being able to do this really intricate scale of, uh, of research by using the thermal cameras and uh, you know, looking at uh, different trees that are able to access different water resources uh, to get them through hot, dry summers and trying to look at the effects of climate change on woodland decline in the, um, in the, the Banksia woodlands of, of Perth. Another little one here, this is um, some work uh, involved with Snowy Hydro. So they collect uh, data on snow depth at a specific location, but don't really have a really good handle on how uh, the data from one point relates to, you know, the whole uh, broader catchment. So the um, opportunities to, uh, to try and use drones to image uh, areas and to look at snow depth and changes in snow depth has really been working to help improve our understanding of how much water comes off these alpine areas and flows down and uh, supports, you know, a huge amount of the renewable um, energy that's provided, um, the um, power generation and uh, the water that's going to be required for the um, anticipated uh, about four and a half billion dollar investment in pumped hydro to try and uh, secure um, a means of storing um, uh, renewable energy su supplies. So in this last section of the uh, talk, what I wanted to do was to just share, I guess, sort of seven kind of lessons, hard learned uh, in lessons that we've sort of um, come up with and, and some of the findings of, of some of the research. And the first one would really be the sort of observation of, you know, let your question dictate the approach. So just because you've got drones and the capability to use drones, they're not necessarily always the right uh, solution. And here's a really nice example from a PhD student, Dan Dixon, who's supported through the CRC for honeybee products, really trying to understand flowering patterns of, of trees. And you can see that photo there of some Mary trees that are in flower with that white sort of um, tinge to them, surrounded by ones that, uh, that aren't flowering. So in this case, Drone imagery is really, really good for providing a validation of flowering at this amazing scale, but completely useless for monitoring trees because we'd have to fly huge areas um, of, the, of the whole state or, or the continent, uh, and we'd need to do it every day, and that's just not practical. So in this case, the drone imagery is being supported uh, into a process to use different sorts of satellite imagery. And in itself, the sorts of things that Dan's trying to do in this project really illustrate how rapidly this whole area is changing. So the Planet Labs um, satellite is, it is not a single satellite like a conventional satellite like uh, Landsat or, or Sentinel, um, but in fact, it's what's called a nano satellite cluster. So it's a, a hundreds of individual satellites that now pass every part of the Earth's sort of surface every day, provide very high resolution imagery. So the sort of research that we're doing in this area wasn't even possible to, to even try and do uh, even two or so years ago. So multiple techniques, multiple methodologies, but using them where they're best and, and most appropriate. These ones here, I've stolen some slides from, uh, from Hustina, who's just completing a, a master's uh, project in, in the school and done superb job and uh, will be presenting this for her thesis defense um, and thesis presentation shortly. But here she's really showing the, the effect of scale. So the um, drones, as you fly them at different heights, are gonna collect different scales of data. So this is the, exactly the same in, image here. Um, in this case, you can see one of the pots and what it looks like up close. And then what's happening as you're flying at different heights. And then with a conventional RGB camera and then also a multi-spectral camera. So the multi-spectral camera is going to give us much, much richer uh, spatial data, uh, spectral data, so it's going to give us other information, things like the near infrared, and we can derive other things like NDVI from that, uh, versus the RGB camera that's going to have much more spatial information, but less spectral information. And you can see as you fly at different heights, things look very different, but it's very much what we'd call horses for courses approach. So what we found in a lot of our research, if you want to identify a specific feature, uh, if you're interested in, in things that fit into nice specific sort of categories, um, then some of that work of Hengel seems to apply really nicely. And basically they suggested that um, if you want to identify an object, you need about four pixels to do it and preferably two uh, across the minimum axis. So if we're doing research and we want to identify a specific object, 
we really use that rule of thumb uh, of at least a minimum of four, preferably six, and aim for about 10 is, is best. But we've found in Hustina's work and some of the other work we've done, there's a whole pile of other published work that really supports this. If you're more looking at a crop, something that's much more of a homogeneous continuous surface, actually flying higher tends to work a lot better and has significant advantages of covering much larger areas. So typically if we're trying to do that work, we take a completely different approach. So trying to understand this subtlety, this idea of horses for courses, depending on your question will dictate you know, how you actually operate the drone. The other one that's been a real learning curve for us has been getting our head around what the software that we use to process the data is. So people would probably be familiar, you, um, you know, collect a whole pile of uh, different photos usually uh, in a drone, and then you use this structure from Motion or SFM software. People will be familiar with the commercial packages like uh, Argisoft Metashape or Pix4D that are pretty commonly used uh, to do this. But you really need to understand what that software is doing and how it's affecting the results that you're going to get out. And the key thing is understanding really what the software is doing is optimizing uh, data to try and create this model. And that can be the location the photo was taken. Um, predominantly, it's the ground control points that we use. So that second point. Uh, and the third one is the camera distortion or the camera model that's used. And those can be really important, a really important uh, thing that we've sort of come across in trying to publish some of the work um, and just sort of understanding it in more detail. So it's really important within the software and some of the software manuals actually tell you to use specific parameters which are completely inappropriate and incorrect. So you need to set um, parameters when you try and fit the models, which are really accurate. Um, use all the data available. So when you're using ground control points, if you've got error for each individual point, include that, don't just use a global uh, error. Um, only add parameters which are necessary. So there's some nice work from uh, Mike James on this and we found uh, that camera model C of his, and again, this is sort of getting into the nitty gritty detail of people that are, you know, processing in, in, in photo scan, uh, in Metashape, and also, you know, the, the, uh, the, the sort of understanding what uh, you're doing and using your ground control points for in terms of fitting uh, the, the model, and then what's an estimate of model error and what's your real error, uh, and making sure that you're using things like ground control points uh, appropriately. Um, Using things like sufficient overlap is really important. So we certainly found that 90% front lap and 75% side lap is a really minimum. Um, we tend to use these um, of sort of uh, approaches of, of most of our field sites are in that sort of couple of hectares range in size. Um, so using about 20 targets where we use 14 as our fitting data set and six as our validation which really allows us you know, a couple to fall over or blow over or something like that. Um, but it really needs a minimum of 12 um, ground control points and then four to validate. And that paper from Martinez um, Caracondo there, you know, is a good little guide in terms of about that sort of um, 0 0.5 ground control point per hectare. So we use those as some rules of thumb um, you know, obviously not using our fitting data set um, in the validation processes. Um, most of the data sets that we've processed, we find that the error is around about four to six times the pixel size. So this gives us a really good guide on what we can expect in terms of error. And then if we're doing topographic change work, like, uh, you know, work on, on sedimentation and changing structures like that, we know from some of the work that's been laid down in a lot of the LIDAR research earlier, that you can only detect a change that's twice the size of your error. So effectively what this means is if you collect one centimetre pixels, we know from our experience that your minimum detectable change is about 10 centimetres. Um, so you need to think very carefully about what scale of data you're going to collect depending on your question and, uh, and select that with, with knowledge of, of how you're uh, going to do that. The other, other stuff that's really useful in this is getting your head around some of the things that you can do, like flying single grids or double grids, imaging straight down or slightly um, obliquely, uh, and how that can help with, with getting more accurate uh, models. It's really important to understand the difference between structure from motion point clouds and LIDAR point clouds. So LIDAR point clouds and structure from motion, which is from the drone technology, uh, look really similar, 
but in fact, they are not the same. So here's some examples of some of the work, you know, on the, um, in the snow. And you can see here on the relatively featureless surface on the snow and in the really dark trees, the algorithms to do this key point matching really struggle to identify specific locations. And these are the locations which become the three dimensional points. So really how this is going to affect your point cloud is really important for the sorts of ways that you use the data set. So LiDAR data sets are going to be much more consistent and the structure from motion ones are going to have their own intricacy. So really important to get your head around how that works and how you can think about how you image um, areas. Number six, so really understanding how multispectral imaging works. So the fact that you're collecting an image which is based upon the intensity of the sun at the particular time, hitting a surface and reflecting back up into your uh, drone sensor. So if you want to fly an area and you just want to look at the relative differences and you're going to fly it over a very short period of time, it's not a cloudy day, then it probably doesn't matter too much the way that you also process this data. But if you want really accurate data, if you want to uh, understand um, you know, or calculate various metrics or you want to conduct time series, you really need to start doing things uh, like using surface calibration, understanding in this case, you know, how the sun's intensity is going to be affected by clouds, uh, really in some ways throwing out data or just not bothering uh, at times if, if it's a, a cloudy day. So cloudy days, some of the data we've got is, is just useless. So, um, you know, if you're trying to do quite quantitative work, um, you need to, uh, to bear that in mind. The last one is really, um, you know, nicely illustrated by some of this work from Mary Murphy, another PhD student in our school who did some of the work on the, on the frost uh, detection. So really trying to also use some of the other techniques. So we're not just flying a drone around trying to look at what we uh, happen to be able to map with it, but also using some things that we've got through our uh, remotely piloted uh, aerial sensing platform in the Faculty of Science. So we've got some hyperspectral imaging uh, equipment and this is uh, what Mary's demonstrating in the field. Uh, and, you know, really nice figure from one of her papers there where she's actually used this sort of stuff to try and, you know, conduct experiments and work out, you know, what spectral bands are going to be useful. Uh, but also the second important learning, you know, multispectral sensors are really quite different. If you look um, at the lower parts of that figure there, um, you can see that, um, you know, the different um, sensors there have um, different bands that they're actually sensing. So one multispectral camera's red is not the same as another. So again, um, you know, if you have different people that fly different sites with different cameras, you might be getting completely different results. So again, some, some other, other things we've sort of learned to, along the way. So I'm gonna wrap it up there. Um, I think there's a couple of questions, which is really good. And uh, I'll uh, throw it over to Sam. Thanks, Nick. That was a fascinating talk. And we've actually got heaps of questions um, ranging from the quite generic to the very, very specific. So we're going to try and work our way through all of them. And if people can continue to post, that'd be great. So um, Maureen Malley's got a couple of questions. Um, firstly, how mature are the privacy laws around drone use in non-scientific settings? And secondly, where do satellites and drones intersect or don't they? Privacy law is a challenging one, and um, I so I guess there's 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 the moral obligations, and then there's the legal ones. Within Australia, I've had it explained to me that there is a actually not a lot of protections available for people, but obviously good practice and and i think you know the moral usage of of drones you know really requires people to use them in, in sensible and respectful ways um the legal um uh, cans and can'ts i'm not uh, particularly a fay with so um you know obviously you know we encourage everyone and we you know use them appropriately we've got um processes through the university to um to to abide by but in some respects, um, uh, there are um, privacy um, sort of uh, restrictions with um, just, you know, Australian law. The um, question on the sort of drones and satellites really falls into the question of um, in most conventional usage of drones, we're limited to flying to about 120 metres. Um, so 
we tend to use drones for much more intensive um, small areas. Some of the more commercial usage of drones can fly them a bit like you know, aircraft over much larger areas. But um, really it's a case of, of using different sorts of satellites. Satellites in themselves have a whole pile of different types of data as well. Some of it uh, is, is really quite accurate. So several meters of pixel size, some of that is hundreds of meters, uh, different spectral information. So it really comes down to, I think, you know, using an approach where you start with your question and then, you, and then think about where the uh, technology can, uh, can best fit. That's great. Thanks, Nick. Um, so Dave Gozard's got a couple of questions, or a few questions. Um, so Dave says that his group is like would like to hover a drone with a laser reflector at one kilometre altitude at a UWA field station such as Shenton Park or Ginjim. Um, three questions, very specific. Any idea how much it would cost to get a CASA exemption for a flight at one kilometre? Would it be worth someone in uh, Dave's group getting an REOC and REPL certified? And what accuracy do you think a drone can hold its lateral position over the ground when flying at one kilometre altitude? Right. Um, we haven't done it because we've tended to avoid it. Someone has suggested to me they paid somewhere in the order of about 1,000, 1,500, 1,200-ish to get an exemption. We can certainly apply for them through our remote operator's certificate. Uh, and, you know, uh, please email me and let's chat to sort that out. Uh, would it be worth someone getting their license? Yes, if they want to fly uh, it themselves, they'll certainly need to be at that. Um, they'll need to have the repo, which is the remote uh, pilot's license. What you won't be able to do is get your own REOC because CASA limits them to one per organisation. So at the present, we because UWA is one ABN and that's the way that CASA work, we have one remote operator certificate for the UWA. It's same for organisations like CSIRO and Geoscience Australia and, and government agencies. Um, how accurate? Depends on what you want to do. Um, if you have the drones fitted with uh, real-time uh, differential uh, systems, they will hold their position with an accuracy of probably about two to three centimetres. Um, and yeah, it just depends. So yeah, come and chat to me. Great, great application. Thanks, Thanks Nick. And I mean, further, further, further recommendations here. That, uh, so Chow Sun says, we use drones to do traffic surveys, but struggle to find a long endurance quadcopter do you have any recommendations uh, for that instance? Yeah, I guess it was one of the challenging things with drones is just the energy density of batteries. And I think this is an area where things will maybe, you know, move into the future. So I know, for example, you know, not that I'm on the payroll of DJI, sadly, but um, like I know they've just re released a new drone, which is now in that sort of 50 to 55 minute, their DJI uh, M300 that's a replacement for the M200 and 210 series. So, you know, most of the drones at the moment are in that half an hour flight time, um, although that's total flight time and, you know, you're probably a little bit shorter than that to be safe. Um, but I think, um, you know, as different alternative energy sources come up, you might uh, see that free up. Um, and really interesting question here from Linda Jeffrey. Um, so have you had any drones taken out by eagles or other birds of prey? Uh, no, we've certainly had a lot of interest from wedgetail eagles. And that's one of the things that we definitely include in our um, briefings. Um, my cousin that works as a surveyor for a mining company have lost about three of the fixed wow. wing planes. Uh, and I think they, he was saying that their insurer uh, isn't very interested in insuring them anymore. <laughs> um, so it's certainly something that we've seen, you know, the birds of prey um, really seem to like the, uh, the drones. They seem to like the aeroplanes a lot more than the, the multi-rotors, and they seem to go the more Phantom and Mavic size, smaller ones than our big um, Matrice, but yeah, you notice a distinct change in bird behavior when you put the drone in the sky. Thanks, Nick. So loads of comments from people just saying what an interesting and informative talk it's been. Um, and Monica Danelvelt says here, do you find much difference in the quality of the processed image using Agisoft or Pix4D? 
and also how do you think something like the open drone map which is an open source software image compares to other commercial um, applications yeah we've done a bit of experimentation with this and it's been more qualitative than actually trying to quantitatively test everything and, and write it up we certainly have gone down the path of using the Agisoft photo, uh, photo scan and it's now called Agisoft Metashape. We find that that is the best balance between being able to control a lot of the parameters. Pix4D, if you want to go and rapidly process data, uh, you want some really nicely put together aesthetic maps. And if you're more into um, qualitative mapping, uh, of sites, then the Pix4D and Argusoft just, you know, running it through seem to work pretty similar ways. They seem to outperform the open source stuff. The open source stuff, um, we've just found for the cost and, you know, I'm lucky that we can buy it in academic licenses and that might be an option that's not available to some of the people listening in. Um, but, you know, we pay, what is it, like $850 for an for a academic license uh, of, of Argisoft. So for us, the time investment in open source software mm. just doesn't make sense. Um, so that's where we've gone uh, with what we do. Thanks. And Carol Kerr's got a question about wind factor. Have you got any suggestions as to the impact and the best parameters to work in with that? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> work in winds that are lighter than what the maximum flight speed of the drone is. I found <laughs> that one out. Um, and, uh, and the emergency switch it on to sport mode can be quite advantageous to recover the drone that's slowly moving away from you. Um, yeah, we've got a little, little cheat sheet that we use um, when we're um, uh, about to set up the drones and, and use, you know, um, uh, apps, weather apps. So typically we say 30 kilometres an hour winds um, is really a sort of limit that we want to sort of probably use. Uh, anything than that tends to shake the camera around anyway a lot and you'll, you end up with a lot of motion blur in your images. Um, so certainly, you know, using a bit of flight planning software, um, you know, is, is a really good idea. And, and yeah, our sort of general rule of thumb is anything over about 30 k's an hour will tend to uh, not bother going out flying. Cool. So we've got a couple of very related questions here from uh, Yusmiana uh, Rahayu and Yusuf Arif uh, Afande, who ask, is there any experience in using drones for benthic habitat mapping, for example, seagrass bed mapping, and also could it be used for coral reef mapping? So can drones be used for seagrass bed mapping and coral reef mapping potentially? Yeah, so the nice little photo I had of, uh, of Shireen when I was talking about the degree, Shireen's done some stuff and, and Carlin Boyer, who's also holds a remote uh, license and uh, works in the Indian Ocean Marine Research Group here at UWA. So they did some stuff um, out off the Scott Reef, operating off boats, doing some coral reef mapping, more exposed stuff, uh, but also some underwater stuff. Uh, there's a whole pile of people that we work with with the Australian Institute of Marine Science Group who are again based at this Indian Ocean Marine uh, Research Group at UWA. So they use a whole pile of stuff with underwater autonomous vehicles, which, you know, in a way a drone is just a, a, a very convenient way of moving a sensor. So in similar ways, um, when you're moving into the underground environment, using automated underwater robots makes a lot of sense, but you're moving similar sorts of sensors. Uh, there's also another group in, in, in School of Biological Sciences. Uh, Renee Hovey does some super uh, work there with some of her uh, collaborators. Um, you know, again, you know, th full three-dimensional structural mapping, benthic habitats, coral reef, kelp beds. Um, yeah, some amazing science questions that you can answer with, uh, with some of the technologies. So, yeah, again, if you've got those questions, I'm happy to sort of try and answer them or, or to, um, you know, pass on some contacts of people I know working in these areas. Thanks, Nick. So two final questions, then we'll wrap up. So Yusuf Arif Afandi again asks, um, you showed some really nice images with stress level um, using the thermal indicator um, for trees. Can you still collect that data even without, uh, even with a drone that doesn't have such a thermal feature? And then finally, from Brady Johnson, who wants to know, do you know of any citizen science projects uh, that uh, use drones where they can contribute to as well without directly being part of a particular lab? 
So is there a place where people can go and can go and do this in the wild, so to speak? Yeah. Um, first one. So, yeah, the thermal imaging, you know, they're quite specific and, and you know, moderately expensive cameras. I think the camera that we use was around the sort of uh, 20,000 Australian dollar mark, which starts making the drones very expensive. But you can certainly do that sort of um, tree stress work with more than multi-spectral sort of data. Um, that one there was quite a specific project and had a whole pile of other uh, work that we were um, sort of doing. Um, but yeah, there's a whole pile of different options. There's some really good uh, work that you can find out there on using either thermal or multi-spectral data for looking at tree stress, tree health sort of questions. Uh, the last question was... Is that basically, are there any, is there anywhere people oh, can citizen go to science. get involved in it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I haven't heard of any here in WA that I know of at the moment. I, um, there's certainly a whole pile that I've seen in the, um, in the Eastern States doing some amazing stuff with um, beach monitoring, beach change monitoring and using a whole suite of of people for doing that. Um, but um, yeah, I'm not aware of any citizen science work, uh, sadly, in, in WA, but uh, maybe that's a, a, a key area for us to tap into uh, all of those amazing people out there with a great interest. Absolutely. So thanks so much again, Nick, for giving such an amazing and interesting talk and to all the questioners and attendees for some great questions. Sorry for about a billion questions there, Nick, but you did a great job answering them all. Uh, and look after yourselves, everyone, and see you at the next session. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.